Chapter 4, Off the Wall I told Jimmy Fargo about Princeton. You're moving? He asked like he couldn't believe it. Not exactly, I answered. We're just going for a year. You're moving, he said. I can't believe it. Neither can I. You don't have to move, he said. You could stay here if you really want to. You think I don't want to stay? I don't know anybody in Princeton. You think I want to go to some school where I don't have any friends? Then tell your mother and father you refuse to go. That's what I do. But where would I live? With me? But where would I sleep? On the floor, Jimmy said. It's good for your back to sleep on the floor. I thought about sleeping on the floor for a year. And about living with Jimmy and his father. Mr. Fargo used to be an actor, but now he's a painter. He paints these weird-looking pictures of circles and triangles and squares. He's, a, he's so absent-minded that he only buys food when Jimmy reminds him. One time I looked in the refrigerator, and all they had was an empty bottle of wine, half an apple, and a salami, and an onion sandwich so old it had turned green. If you don't stay, I'm never going to talk to you again, Jimmy said. I mean never. He bent down and tied his shoelace. Jimmy's laces were always undone. And I'm going to tell Sheila Tubman she can have your rock in the park, he added. You wouldn't. Try me. Some friend you're turning out to be. Same for you. Jimmy turned and walked away, his hands stuffed deep in his pockets. I thought of plenty more to say as soon as he was gone, but instead of running down the street after him, I went home. Is that you, Peter? Mom called. No. I went to my room and slammed my bedroom door. I was glad that I hadn't bothered to hang up my map of the world again. I took out my Crickens crystal. Jimmy gave it to me on my last birthday. When I couldn't fall asleep at night, I'd hold the chain above the lucid base and watch the small ball swing from side to side. I concentrate on it until my eyes get this heavy feeling and want to close. I open my window enough to throw out my Crescens crystal. I imagine it smashing into a zillion pieces on the sidewalk below. But suppose I had trouble falling asleep in Princeton. What would I do? I put it back in its box. There better, there had to be a better way to get even with Jimmy Fargo. Two hours later, I was still thinking up ways to get back at him when the doorbell rang, and it was Jimmy. Changed my mind, he said, and I'm sorry. Yeah, well, me too. I was disappointed, that's all. I don't want you to move, but there's nothing I can do about it. It's not your fault. That's what I'm trying. That's what I was trying to tell you. I said. I know. Well, my father says Princeton's just an hour by train. That's right. So I won't give Sheila your rock after all. Thanks. She wouldn't know what to do with it anyway. I said. But I'm not going to use it until you come back. Okay. I want you my Kreskin's crystal until I get back either. Deal, Jimmy said, and we shook on it. The next morning, when I was going down in the elevator with Turtle, Henry said. I'm going to miss you and your family. Bet you won't miss Fudge, I said. Oh, yes. Even that little devil, Henry said. I remember the days he got in my elevator and pushed all the buttons at once. Jammed up the works for two hours, Henry laughed. He sounded like a sea lion. I always expect him to slap his arms together when he laughs. And I'll miss that baby of yours, too. Won't get to see her grow up now. Sure you will, I told him. We're only going for a year. That's what they all say, Henry muttered. Outside, it was gray and humid. I wondered if the sun was shining in Princeton. As I walked Turtle down the street, he sniffed here and there, trying to find a place he liked. I encouraged him to use the curb. In Princeton, he'll be able to go wherever he likes, I thought. Maybe he, I, I won't even have to walk him. I'll just open the door, he'll run out into the yard, and I won't have to clean up after him either. Ever since New York City passed what I call the doggy do law, walking Turtle hasn't been that much fun. At first, when I heard that every dog owner had to clean up after his own dog, I told Mom that I wouldn't be able to walk Turtle anymore. Mom said, Too bad, Peter, because if you don't walk him, who will? I was hoping Mom would volunteer. I was hoping she'd say, I know how grossed out you feel at the idea of picking up Turtle's do dog do. But she didn't. Instead, she said, Look, Peter, you're going to have to make a tough decision if you want to keep Turtle you're going to have to clean up after him. Otherwise, Daddy and I will try to find a nice farm somewhere in the country, and... I didn't want her to finish. Send Turtle to a farm, I shouted. Are you kidding me? He's a city dog. He's my dog. Well, then, Mom said, smiling, I got the point. Mom bought me a contraption called a pooper scooper. It's the kind of shovel attached to a baggie. 
And so when Turtles does his thing, I scoop it up, get it into the baggie, tie it up at the end, and toss it into the trash basket. At first, I made a mess of myself trying to get it, into, trying to get it to work. But now I'm a regular expert. Still, it's pretty disgusting. Almost as disgusting as Tootsie's diapers. I wish I could train Turtle to use the toilet, especially in the winter, when I stand around freezing while he takes his time trying to make up his mind. I know it's not Turtle's fault. He can't help being a dog. And when he sleeps at the foot of my bed or licks my face, it's all worth it. Just as Turtle was finishing, Sheila Tubman came skipping up the street. I hear you're moving, she said. I nodded and scooped up his stuff. Good. I was afraid it was just a rumor. I can't wait until you're gone. Then I won't have to smell your yucky dog anymore. My dog's not yucky, I yelled, tying up the poop bag. Did you ever smell him, Peter? Yes, all the time. Well, I guess you didn't don't notice the smell because you smell so much like him yourself, she said, skipping away. Hey, Sheila, I called. Yes? She turned around. Stuff it. Peter Hatcher, you are disgusting. That's better than what you are, I called, enjoying myself. Oh, yeah? What's that? She asked. That's for me to know and you to find out. Ha, <laughs> ha, very funny, she said. You and your yucky dog are both very funny. Sicker, Turtle, I said. Turtle growled and then started barking, which was very funny because he doesn't know what sicker means. But Sheila didn't know that. He didn't know. So she started screaming and running toward our building. And when Turtle saw her go crazy like that, he took off after her, barking up a storm, thinking it was some kind of game. He pulled his leash right out of my hand, so I had to chase him, calling, Turtle! Turtle! Down, boy! Because he was already jumping up and down on Sheila, trying to lick her face. Sheila just kept right on screaming. Finally, Henry came out and asked, What's going on out here? He, per he pulled Turtle off Sheila and held him to me. And I picked up the end of his leash and patted his head. It's Peter Hatcher, Sheila said. He told his dumb dog to sick me, and he did. He did not. I said, he did too. You don't even know what sick means, I said. I certainly do. Oh yeah, what? I asked. It means, it's like, like giving germs to a person, Sheila said. The one he sicks, gets sick too. I started laughing. Did you hear that, Henry? Did you hear what she said? I heard, Henry said. And I want you to keep your dog outside until he calms down. He turned to Sheila. Come on, honey, I'll take you upstairs first. I am so glad he's moving, Sheila sniffed. I hope he never comes back. There should be a law. I laughed all the way to the corner. I think Turtle did, too. On the morning of the move, Mom woke me up at 6 o'clock. I still have to pack my carton of special things. But first, I want some juice. I'm always thirsty first thing in the morning. On my way to the kitchen, I passed Tootsie's crib. She was watching her mobile and gurgling away. She was always covered with trading stamps. They were stuck to her arms, her legs, her belly, and her face. She even had one on the top of her head, and one pasted to the bottom of each foot. Hey, Mom, I called. What is it? It's Tootsie. But I just... I didn't wait for her to finish. Hurry up, Mom, I called. Mom raced in, buttoned up her skirt. Oh, no, she said when she saw Tootsie. Then she shouted, Fudge! Hello, Mommy! Fudge said, crawling out from under Tootsie's cribs. He was wearing a disguise. Black eyeglasses, frames attached with a rubber nose with a stick-on beard and mustache. He'd sent away for it months ago. It cost four cereal box tops plus 25 cents. Did you do that to Tootsie? Yes, mommy. He was using his best little boy in the world voice. Why, mom asked. Tootsie told me to. He climbed up to the side of her crib and reached in, shaking Tootsie a little. Didn't you tell me to, good girl, good little baby? Tootsie said, ah, 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 and she kicked her legs up in the air. That was a very naughty thing to do, Mom told Fudge, and I am very angry at you. Fudge kissed my mother's hand. I love you, Mommy. That's not going to work today, Mom told him. I love you anyway, he said, kissing her other hand. You're the best mommy in the whole world. Don't you love your little boy? Yes, I love you, she said, but I am still very angry at you. Very. And she smacked Fudge on his backside. He pouted for a minute, about to cry, then changed his mind. Didn't hurt, he said. You want one that will hurt? Mom asked. No. Then don't you ever do anything like that again. Do you understand? Yes. Hey, Mom, I said, I thought you don't believe in violence. 
I don't ordinarily, Mom said, but sometimes I forget. Look, it's okay for me if you want to spank Fudge, I said. Personally, I think a spanking a day would be good for him. No, 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 Fudge shouted, holding his rear end. Why do you really do it, I asked him. I want to trade her for a two-wheeler like yours, he told me. Oh, you can't trade her in, Mom said. She's a person. Not, she's not a book of stamps. But she looks like a book of stamps, Fudge said. Mom picked up Tootsie. Well, doesn't she? Fudge asked again, and I could tell Mom was trying hard not to laugh. You know something, Fudge, I said. You're off the wall. You are really off the wall. Off the wall, off the wall, he sang, dancing around Mom and Tootsie. Fudgy is off the wall. Tootsie laughed. Either that or she hicked up. It's hard to tell the difference. I followed Mom into the bathroom where she set Tootsie in the sink. Two years of trading stamps down the drain, I said. Goodbye, stamps, Fudge called from the doorway. Goodbye, goodbye. I'm not going to save stamps anymore, Mom said. I'm going to find a grocery store that gives away something else. An hour later, Dad came back with the U-Haul and was loaded and we loaded and we were on our way. As soon as we were through the Lincoln Tunnel, Fudge started singing. M-A-N-E. Spells Princeton. No, it doesn't, stupid. I said, it spells Maine. I know, Fudge said. I'm just making up a song. Well, maybe you could make it up in your head, Dad suggested. And sing it at us when we get to Princeton. Then it'll be a surprise. Oh, a surprise, Fudge said. I like surprises. He was quiet for a minute. Then he said, you know what, Daddy? I'm off the wall. Who told you that? Dad asked. Peter, didn't you? He asked me. Yep, I said. I sure did. And you sure are. I'm off the wall, Fudge repeated. Just like Peter's map of the world. He rested his head against Mom's shoulders and I could hear him slurping away in his fingers. He was still wearing his disguise.